those. But here we are, the second to last message in the series of Psalm 91. And um, let me just start off by asking this question. How many of you in here today would agree with me that angels exist? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Let me ask you another question. How many of you would say today that angels are very active and at work right now? Would you agree with that? All right. So th today we're going to look at the subject of the supernatural or the majestic watch care of God for his children, for us, for the saints. And that's what we're going to look at here in Psalm 91. We're going to be looking at verse number 10. Psalm 91 and verse number 10. And ha like we have each and every week, I'm going to ask that you read this verse out loud with me. Verses 10, 11, 12, and 13, beginning in verse number 10. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful time we've had here today, the wonderful worship and the presence of your spirit that is in this place. We ask that you would be with us now as we open your word, open our, our ears to hear it, but more importantly, open our hearts to receive the word today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move from heart to heart, convicting the sinner, encouraging the saint, challenging the saint, whatever the case might be, we ask that you do it freely. Holy Spirit, I ask that you uh, completely take over my mind this morning. That I may, may I say nothing unless you want me to say it. I love you today. And I just pray that you will be my mouthpiece. And God, may I remind you one more time that I cannot do this alone. That I cannot do this in my own strength. And so my prayer is today that the Holy Spirit will do the preaching. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I would hope that you would agree with me. That God is a very giving God. In fact, we see all through Scripture that God is a very giving God. And the most profound gift that He ever gave, we find over there in the third chapter of John and the 16th verse, which says, For God so loved the world that He gave, say that with me, that He gave His only begotten Son. That was the greatest gift that He could have ever given. But... What is so great about God is that not only did he give us his son, which we needed, yes, very much so, we needed for salvation, but he also gave us two supernatural entities or beings, if you want to call them that, that are with us and that guide us and protect us each and every day. You see, when Jesus left this earth as he was ascending into heaven, he gave us some great words of peace by saying that I am going to send a comforter. So one of those two things that he uses to guide and direct and to comfort us is the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit today. It is possible for me and for you to live above sin through the power of the Holy Spirit that lies within our hearts and within our lives. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding and directing. And most importantly, the Holy Spirit is the one that is drawing sinners to Jesus. You know, you do know that the scripture tells us that without the Spirit drawing them, no one gets saved. So the Holy Spirit is very important. And then the second, the second thing that God has given us to lead, guide, and direct and protect us are his angels. His angels in heaven. By the way, I don't know if you knew this or not, but his angels, you can't even really number the amount of angels that God has in heaven. There's really no way to number it. And I, I believe I've shared with you this story before about um, some mathematicians that got together and tried to calculate how many angels were in heaven. And they tried using uh, regular calculators that me and you might use each and every day. And they figured out that it couldn't count that high. And so they spent seven years building a special computer to calculate how many angels 
were in heaven. And after seven years of working so very hard, spending millions and millions of dollars to build this computer, they put all of the calculations into the computer, and it simply reads air. Now, that would be pretty frustrating, wouldn't it? And so the bottom line is, is that there's, there's really no way for us to grasp the amount of angels um, that, that are in heaven and that are uh, existing around us each and every day. Now, with that in mind, we know that God is giving. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us his angels. But he has also given us, and, and through those two entities, he has given us great provision. With all of that in mind, I want you to contextualize with me the passage, or this passage of Scripture. Now, we know that Psalm 91, or we believe that Psalm 91 uh, was written by Moses. Okay? Now, some people do not uh, know or understand. Uh, they think that, that David wrote all of Psalms. But there are a handful of Psalms that we know uh, through historical documents and through actually direct references in the Psalms that Moses wrote them during the period of time in which the children of Israel were in bondage. And so here in Psalm 91, we believe that this is actually written by Moses. One of the reasons we believe that is because Psalm 91 is really communicated in the context of the Israelites' pilgrimage from Egypt to Canaan. So we, we believe that, it, that uh, that's the context in which it is written. Now, if you look here in these verses of Scripture, you find two animals that are, that are referred to here in um, verses 12 and verse, verses 13. Look at those with me. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will not tread or you will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the great serpent. Now, Moses was writing these as, as a literal interpretation. He was writing this about what they were literally experiencing while they were in process from Egypt to Canaan. And so here in these verses of Scripture, we find that it's, it's Moses writing literally. But let me ask you a question. How many of you in here today faced a lion yesterday? Raise your hand. Oh, you went to the zoo. Okay, that's good. But literally faced a lion. How many of you faced a cobra? I, okay, all right. Okay, you went to the zoo too. That's great. All right, well, here's the bottom line. I don't think many of us deal with literal lions and literal cobras each and every day. Now, I know we've got some copperheads down in this area, don't we? Yeah. We don't want anything to do with them. But, uh, but I'm not sure if we have any cobras. And so we, what we must come to the conclusion is, is that what applies, what, what of these scriptures apply to us? What is the application for, for our uh, each and everyday lives? So here's what we find out. We find out that Psalm 91, we cannot apply this literally. We must apply it as an analogy. Now, does scripture not tell us that Satan is a roaring, I'll say it again, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Or as the New Living Translation puts it, seeking whom he may kill. Well, that's strong. And so, so we must understand the, the analogy here is that we are comparing the lion to Satan. Now, where else? Or what else is Satan compared to in Scripture? Anybody know? A serpent. Yes. He is referred to as the serpent. In fact, it says that the serpent came to Eve, right? And the serpent tempted her and she gave in to that temptation. Then Adam gave in to the same temptation. And therefore sin was introduced into the world. But also it says later on in Scripture, that Jesus came to bruise with his heel the head of the serpent. So are you understanding with me here, in these verses of Scripture, we're not talking about literal lions and literal um, cobras, but we are talking about Satan. That's what we are talking about. And if we are talking about Satan, 
then we must understand that the description that is given here in Psalm 91 is not physical, but it is spiritual. Because you see, Satan is a spiritual being. So you might be asking, well, with, so what does all of this really mean? Well, with all of that in mind, with all of that in mind, I want to break down this passage into four different areas to help us better understand the context of these verses. If we know that Satan is a spiritual being and that he is warring, then who is he warring against? Well, he is warring against God and his angels. That is why the scripture says that he will give his angels charge over you. So let's break this down. So number one, what is the meaning of this passage? Well, this was written to the children of Israel about the danger that lied ahead for them. The danger that was coming down the road. The, the, the things that they might face. But God gives this promise to them. And by giving to them, God has given it to us in our journey from here to the promised land or from here to heaven. You see, the promise I will... The promise I will give my angels charge over you. That is the promise that we see here in Psalm 91. How were the children of Israel? Now you're going to have to think back to uh, the, the book of Exodus. Okay, where we find much of this. What was it or how did God prove his presence to the children of Israel? You need to go back a few years to Sunday school. Now for some of you, that's a lot longer ago than the rest of us. Sunday school for me was about uh, 20 years ago. Sunday school for some of you was 40, 50, 60 years ago. Anyway, we'll leave that alone. But we got to go back to Sunday school and think about the lessons that we learned about the Exodus. The, the children of God going from Egypt, making, trying to get to Canaan. And God... Ha guaranteed his presence, and he showed the, his physical presence in two ways. Some of you remember this. Yes, I just heard it. Fire and a cloud. Fire by night, a pillar of fire by night, and a pillar of cloud by day. That's how they knew that he was with them, and that he was guiding them, and that he was directing them. But you see, these verses reveal a spiritual battle that is both invisible and visible. So, for the children of Israel, they had the visible presence of God. But for us, do we have a visible presence of God? Can you see God? No. Can you see the Holy Spirit? No. So therefore... In our world, we don't have a visible presence of God, but we have the spiritual presence of Almighty God through two ways. One, being the Holy Spirit, and two, being His angels. So we must make the application of this passage a spiritual, not physical. Now, we must also understand that when you talk about this spiritual battle between Satan and between God... What is the battle about? What is the war about? Well, it is the war for man's soul. Now, you see, for the children of Israel, it was not a war for the soul. It was a war for the promised land. The, the children of Israel, Satan did not want them to make it to the promised land. He wanted to keep them in bondage, and his goal was to keep them in the wilderness. And he did that for a little while. He did it for about 40 years, if you remember. He kept them in the wilderness. So there's this war that's going on between God and Satan. It is the war for the souls of mankind. Now don't miss this. It is not a war for our life as, exi as it exists here on earth. Let me say that one more time. This battle that is raging is not for our life as it exists here on earth. But rather... The war is whether we attain eternal life. Did you hear me this morning? It's not a physical battle of whether you are kept from danger or whether you are kept from this or that disease or a car accident. 
It is, it is a war that is warring for your eternal soul. Now, you must capture this to understand the context of the passage and of the message today. If you have the notion that God's protection and care, His angelic watch and ministry over us is only about this life, friend, you are sorely mistaken. The real idea is, is not our fleshly existence. God is most concerned about our spiritual reality and our spiritual journey to eternity. Don't miss that this morning. Don't get wrapped up in the physical. Now, do I believe God protects us? Do I believe He keeps us from harm? Absolutely. But His main concern is, is making sure that your soul is kept safe from this journey of here on earth to eternity. He wants you to, your soul to arrive to heaven safely. That is his goal. We must keep that in mind in understanding these verses of Scripture. <laughs> he, is, he is so concerned about you getting to eternity safely that he will use, don't miss this. I'm going to say that about 20 times in the message today. So just don't miss anything, all right? And if you do, get, get a copy of it, and then you really won't miss anything, okay? All right. He is so concerned about you getting to eternity safely that he will even use the crisis of your life to get you there. Let me say that one more time. He is so concerned, he is so concerned about you getting to eternity safely that he will use the crisis of your life to get you closer to him in hopes that you will make it to heaven. Let me, I have a friend of mine that, or Julie and I have some friends up in Ohio, and uh, the gentleman's name was Earl, Earl and Rachel, and they had just come to the church at Titus Avenue when we arrived there in Middletown, and they had just come maybe a year before, um, and we became friends with them, and Earl was dealing with quite a crisis in his life. Earl owned a car dealership, and um, one day he just decided that he would start taking cash for cars. Now, if you know anything about the car business, that is pretty illegal. You're not really allowed to do that. And he got himself into some trouble, and one day he actually sold a car to a gentleman who paid with what you would call dirty money. It was drug money. And actually, it was through its trail, the, the FBI traced it all the way back to a drug cartel in Mexico. And so Earl goes from, the, he has a car lot, he has all these rental properties. He goes from being an, a complete millionaire. He told me one time that his financial portfolio was about $7 million. He was a, a millionaire. And starting on that day, he began to lose all of his money. He lost his car business. He lost many of his rental properties. And then, as you know how the government is, when they start sniffing around, they just don't find one thing. They find everything. And before you know it, he also was not being very honest on his taxes. And by the time it was all said and done, Earl had to go to prison for two years. Now, he was a new Christian. He thought everything was okay. He thought he knew he had made some mistakes in the past, but... He had gotten saved. He was trying to do what's right. And then out of nowhere, here comes the federal government and the FBI and the IRS. And he lost just about everything. After Earl got back from prison, by the way, it wasn't like, I mean, it wasn't like Steve Preach's prison, all right, where he works. It was like, because his is like hardcore, all right. It was like um, where Martha Stewart went. You know what I'm saying? One of them type deals. White collar prison. Um, they were able to watch TV. And they were, they, even, they were even allowed to have computer time. And they weren't really under any lockdown or anything. So it, was, it really wasn't prison. But anyway, that's beside the fact. That's a whole other message. Um, but I remember when he got back. And I... I was really eager to sit down and talk to him and kind of, you know, what do you think of God now and now that you've been through all of this? And so one night me and the senior pastor were stayed late after church and Earl 
was talking, telling us his story about prison and what he experienced. And by the way, while he was in prison, he led eight men to Jesus Christ. But he said something that was so profound. I don't, I don't want you to miss this this morning. He said, I would never want to go through this again unless I met Jesus. His point was, I'll go through this again if when it's all said and done, I have a closer encounter with Jesus Christ. You see, God used the crisis of his life. God did not protect him. Don't miss this. I, I told you I'd say that a lot today. God, God did not protect him from the crisis. He put him through the crisis to get him closer to the Father. Amen. And likewise, he does the same with us. God gives his angels the responsibility of getting his saints home safely. Not getting his saints out of trouble. Or not getting his saints out of a dangerous situation. But he has assigned his angels to see us through to eternity. Through the storms of life. Through the fire. Through awful circumstances. Through great sickness and pain. Through tragedy. God's angels are commissioned to get us home. That's, what he's, that's their responsibility. So that is the meaning of the passage. Not physical, but spiritual. Some of the meaning of this passage is that God wants his angels to watch over and care for us in order to get us home. So we see the meaning. Secondly, let's look at the problem of the passage. Let's look at the problem. Now, some of you are thinking, preacher, you have a problem with scripture? Well... Here's the point. If you take this scripture literally and physically, you will have an issue with this word, with Psalm 91. So let's, let's break this down and help us understand just a little bit more. The problem with the passage is what about those who have met death? What about those who have already experienced great pain in their lives? I'm sure many of us here today have experienced some type of sudden loss or tragedy in our lives. So what about those loved ones? They lost the physical battle, but what happened when they faced death itself? Well, we can all be assured that even when facing death, that God's angels are protecting us. And we must trust His promise as David trusted His promise. Psalm 23, we quote this all of the time and we hear it quoted at funerals and well I'm not going to say that that's not nice okay Psalm 23 are you ready the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restoreth my soul he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil. What is David talking about? David is talking about that when he faces death itself, when he faces the final moment of life, he will not fear because God's ministering angels are going to wrap their arms around his precious soul and take him to a home and to eternity. That's what David's talking about. So even for those who have experienced great loss, or those who have faced death itself, there is a promise that his angels will take us home. Let's look at Acts. I want you to look at Acts chapter 7 with me as we see the story of Stephen. Stephen got this. Don't miss this. Stephen got this. Let's look at these verses. Verse number 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let's grasp that one. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. We have just, we have just read a beautiful story about Psalm 91. And the ministry of angels. Do you not see it here? Do you see where Stephen, even facing death, staring death right in the face, he looks up full of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, let me stop here for just a minute and explain this. When it says here that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, do you know where Stephen was? In the secret place. Amen. Psalm 91, verse number 1. For those who dwell in the secret place, in the shelter of the Almighty. That's where Stephen was when it says he was full of the Holy Ghost. Stephen looks up and he, he knows death is coming. He knows what is coming for him. But he looks up and he sees Jesus. And I can only imagine for just a moment, I, I'd say he saw some angels too, wouldn't you? And then when death came itself, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And at that moment, God's ministering angel swooped down, picked up his soul, and ushered it into the presence of Almighty God. Do you see, you see, Stephen faced the physical death, but he didn't face the spiritual death. Number three, we must understand the eternal dimensions of the passage. The eternal dimensions of this passage. We must come to a place where we understand that God continues to care even after death. His ministering angels are caring for us even after death. God said, I'm going to be with you in the crisis. I'm going to be with you after the crisis. And I'm going to be with you in eternity. What joy that can bring us. Even in death, there is victory. Why is there, why is there victory even in death? Not because of the angels. There's no victory in death because of the angels. There is victory in death because of Jesus Christ. And what he faced, he faced death itself. And the scripture says he conquered death, hell, and the grave. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? For it's been swallowed up in victory. Amen. What victory? The victory of Jesus. So not only is he with us in our everyday lives, but even when we meet death, God and his angels are with us. And even in eternity, his angels are with us. You know, I think about this thought from time to time. God's angels are created. They're created beings. And they're created to do one thing. Worship and obey God. Now, we were born a little bit different. We were, we were created by God. We were created in the image of God. But, but, we're, we were created with a free will. Angels were not created with a free will. And I often think about the fact that when I get to heaven, God's angels are going to have to step aside. They'll be, the, they'll be at the throne worshiping God, but they're going to have to step aside when I get there because I'm going to go see Jesus and God and worship at the feet of Jesus. Number four, in closing, we must understand and know the comfort of the passage, the comfort of this verse. One of my favorite hymns, Be not dismayed where'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Sing it, church. God will take care of you. Through every day, all of the way, God will take care of you. God will take 
take care of you. God will take care of us. But he does it angelically. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew of this passage, it says that not just some or one or some Cupid angel that shoots you in the rear. Hello? You hear me? Not little Cupid that shoots you with a bow and arrow in the rear to make you fall in love. We're not talking about that angel. But in the Hebrew, in these verses of Scripture, it says that all of God's angels, all of God's angels are watching over and protecting us. The book of Hebrews tells us regarding the angel spirits in Hebrews chapter 1 that the angels are given to those who inherit salvation. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that God has charged his angels over us. In other words, those of us who are saved, this isn't a blanket promise of provision to everyone. No, the angels may intersect in history and in the destiny of nations and at, the, at nature itself. Yet this is a personal promise to believers. And therefore, believers only, it is a promise to us that God is present. And not only is God present by his spirit, but he has added the presence of his angels to provide for us and to minister to us and even through us. I believe that the greatest display of, of God's comfort and God's angels is in the death of a precious saint of God. Would you believe that? Would you agree with that? That the greatest display of God's ministering angels are when a precious saint of God goes to be in heaven. My great aunt Libby, uh, who was more like a grandmother to us than a great aunt, and spent her entire life raising children that were not her own. Um, she was a house mother at a children's home in Ohio, and when the tornadoes came through in 1973, came through Xenia, Ohio, and literally wiped the entire town out and killed uh, nearly 300 people. She was responsible for getting all 600 children to safety. And President Nixon came um, a few weeks later and, and presented her with a, with a medal, and she got to meet the president. She was a great woman of God, a great saint of God. And just a few years ago, I guess it's been about three years now, um, she had fallen and broken her hip. And so she was taken to the hospital and she never recovered from that. And I remember the day that they called us and said, She's, she is dying and uh, you need to call in the family. And so we all gathered there, my mom and it was my mom's aunt and um, me and my brothers and sister and Julie was with us. And she was on a... Um, breathing tube and we had shut that off and taken her off of that and she was sitting there breathing very very heavily and labored and we just began to sing some of her favorite songs that she loved to hear us sing and I remember as the breaths got shorter or as, as more time started between each breath her eyes were open and I just remember that she was just kind of staring straight ahead. And, and I, we knew that she wasn't there. And I wondered to myself, I wonder what she sees. And I thought for a moment, I wonder if she can see God's holy angels coming for her soul. And it was at that moment I began to sing, Going home, I'm going home. There is nothing to hold me here. <laughs> I caught a glimpse of that heavenly land. Praise God, I am going home. And at that moment, she took her last breath. And slipped into eternity. Amen. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That all of God's angels. Not just one. I believe all of God's angels came. Yeah. And picked up her precious soul. And took her and laid her at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Where she didn't have a broken hip anymore. She didn't have dementia anymore. 
but she was made whole. What joy and what assurance and what peace we can have in knowing that God has charged his angels over us to lead and guide us and in some cases protect us physically. But if we're not protected physically, we are always protected spiritually. And their job is to get us home. 